Hey, GP learners, as we move towards a restoration phase following our current health crisis, many people are looking towards primary care networks to try and improve the way that primary care is continuing to work. We've done a lot of change over the past few months, and in terms of the clinical directorship, we've seen significant challenges come, including the provisional draft consultation on the PCN clinical DES, the subsequent changes that happen, and then our health crisis as well, the biggest disruptor of all. Well, throughout this period, I've been following one person that's helped me in terms of understanding how to do this role effectively and show me what you can really do when you want to innovate things. He's done some amazing stuff, including sourcing PP for his local areas and led the charge for practices doing this, as well as various other changes in his practices and his network areas. And we talk about some really cool things in this episode. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you watch it. Definitely enjoy this episode. I'm talking in this episode with Dr. Dave Triska, and let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. Hey, HB learners. Many of you I know are clinical directors out there that are currently understanding how to navigate the job. And like myself and Andy, who we talk about obviously our clinical director journey on a regular basis, it's something that we're learning as time goes on. Well, there's definitely one person I've been learning a lot from over the past few months, and particularly with certain challenges that we've all faced recently, and that's Dr. Dave Triska, who's joining us today. How are we doing, Dave? Yeah, really well, thank you. Nice to see you. So I like to let people introduce themselves. I know briefly a little bit about yourself as you work down south, you run an amazing practice and we talked about certain things in our Ask My GP episode, which people can check out if they want to right here. But more importantly, you're also a clinical director that's done some pretty awesome things. So tell us briefly about yourself. Uh, so um, general background is I, before I became a civilian GP, I was in the army as uh, an army GP for uh, about 10 years or so. Uh, left, came out, joined practice. Um, we got into the whole PCM bit. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think it was one of those things where we needed time with people who'd maybe done a bit of management type stuff before. Um, if, if nothing else, the army definitely does that. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> like many people ended up sticking my hand up for a job, uh, which was still pretty um, pretty much information wasn't it and then uh, on the way we have the PCN des debacle we've got a global pandemic so you know the job's pretty different to 12 months ago isn't it definitely I mean compared to what I think we signed up for it's a different beast entirely and that's because of the two big things that you mentioned so if we go through those in order I mean you mentioned the PCN des stuff I mean that was transformational change just after Christmas and moving forward to the middle of January and things what was your experience of that, particularly with practices and then helping to keep them, I guess, sighted of what the changes were? Yeah, so at that particular moment, um, I, I, I was thinking, I, I don't really see how 2020 can get more stressful. I wasn't, wasn't right, obviously. Um, I think some of it was the frustration about what we'd signed up for. So from practices, we'd signed up as in GPs, I think, because we were being handed back some control about our destinies and we could start to shape things in the way that we know that they should be shaped. Um, I think if nothing else, COVID has shown us that if you just let GPs get on with stuff, they're actually pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, I found myself surprisingly in quite a militant position uh, having these structures imposed by NHS England, which were clearly barking mm. and would have decimated general practice. Um, so for someone who's re- been relatively uh, well trained in following his masters, it was unusual to find myself uh, in publications with letters going off to various places, um, largely because I, I, I don't know how many people felt enabled to be like that um mm. i don't know i don't know whether that was just me being a bit reckless um and and happy to take the consequences on the chin but it just felt like that was that was a time when gps needed people to step forward and just say yeah thanks i'm not really so happy with this and we're, and we're going to speak out as one one body mm-hmm. i mean it's interesting i think the pcn does and, and me and andy talked about this quite a few times through our podcast and stuff that it was probably one of the most unifying experiences that primary care and general practice has ever had for a significant period of time, positively or negatively, I guess that's the, the outcome, but it unified the entire profession pretty much. Yes, which is an interesting uh, side benefit. I'm not sure that was intention, um, <laughs> but, but um, it, was the, it was the first time in my career that I've seen doctors so united. Um, so, so certainly across a prof- uh, you know a professional grade, it was just phenomenal, and I'm so proud of everyone that you know was involved in that and what what everyone did, and just the strength of feeling. Um, 
it was a great moment in many respects, a terrible moment, but also a great moment because uh, when, when we weren't sure would general practice survive, it looked like it was on the ropes, you know, it's a bit like end of Rocky Four comes reeling back and uh, strikes the knockout blow, it was brilliant. Definitely. And I think we have seen a, a significant shift in the original proposed as contractual information and obviously now what we have, which um, f- for information for our EGP owners, we're filming this literally just before the sign-up deadline finishes. I think it's got two or three days left to go. So there is that slight caveat with this episode. Um, but I guess in terms of what we now have, I mean, there's still some apprehension about what the DES was looking like. I think it's definitely a considerable movement from the original version. There are still some hesitations, though, about some of the requirements and things. I mean, what's your view on where what the contract looks like now? I think it's the best we're going to get. But if I was asking again, I would say to NHS England, you have just watched what happens if you let United Kingdom general practice cope with a crisis. Mm-hmm. And we, we were very much left on our own for most of that. I know all the guidance I wrote preceded anything that came centrally by many weeks. And I think that was mm-hmm. the same for most GPs. So why not have a bit more trust in us? Because for goodness sake, we've just dealt with one of the biggest global health crises uh, that we've ever seen and dealt with it with a plomb. And mm-hmm. yet you still want to impose centralized box ticking and structures to us just have some trust and let us do the things that we know we need to do yeah and i guess for anybody that does happen to have been living under a rock for the past 10 weeks or so and hasn't got a clue what we're talking about also we are talking about the ultimate disruptor which has been covid effectively and how that has just shifted primary care um you mentioned obviously how general practice has risen to the challenge and, and tackled it head on and things i mean what was your experience over the past 10 weeks i think that you see the true nature of people in a crisis and i say that with with my whole job very much in mind um there's nowhere to hide when things go badly wrong and Mm -hmm. there's nowhere to hide when you've got that nervous anxious feeling in the bottom of your stomach but you know what the next day you've still got to do your job and gps did it and we turned Mm -hmm. it around and we did everything that we needed to do um we got our patients safe we carried on running a service and again as i say on absolutely threadbare guidance at the time um, it's a bit more fleshed out now so it that that there was there are many people who are going to walk out of this able to hold their head high and it will be a defining moment of their careers mm-hmm. i don't know for me personally um one of the defining elements of this whole you know health crisis that we've had to deal with was um the instructions and the guidance and all the other stuff that came out around pp so personal protective equipment and, and all that kind of stuff and one of the things i remember is late one evening sending you a message on twitter saying dave how on earth did you find all this pp and please help me um yeah I, I mean for me that was a massive thing you particularly have and from my perspective led the way we're trying to help practices in effect crowdsource ppe tell us about that it was it was born out of frustration um so i I was very much on side with things towards the start of the crisis and then there were cracks started to appear in in my belief in what the guidance was because my rational brain was telling me we don't really know what all this means and what it's doing so it seems logical that we should be playing much safer than we are Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what ppe was um the the frustrations at that point were access to things Uh, i still haven't had a ppe delivery i must add um aside from the initial one of the formal stuff um the, the the main issue at that particular moment was staff feeling exposed so this was faces particularly um you couldn't get anything for love and money in terms of the official supply chains or you know any of the online suppliers mm. so just sort of idly flicking through my geeky twitter account and various things just noted that um, a small check company had, had had designed a 3d printed um face visor so full face visor much better than anything we've actually ever been offered and um yeah, stuck it on local Facebook, said, hey, anyone got a 3D printer they could help a practice out with? And then a week later, I think there was about 80,000 being made across the UK. So it was um, a, a brilliant moment. I think more about the, the story of practices taking back control and how much their community supported them. Mm-hmm. I think the, the side story was about how poor the supply was. But I think just f- making practices feel like they could actually do something rather than sort of ranting into the, the ether about the unjustness of it, which is fair. Um, but actually, people just felt so enabled and just so much safer as well. 
Yeah, I think there's definitely that element of when there's a problem, trying to identify and understand how that problem can be fixed and, and improved. But then there is also that element of just get on with it. Don't wait for somebody else to try and fix your problem because time is often the biggest challenge with that. And, and I know for us, ours was that we were looking at creating a clinical management center. And whilst the clinicians generally had the acceptance that they were happy to work with that, the biggest actual challenge we had was convincing our administrative staff to work in these kind of centers because their fear and their anxiety about the exposure, like you said, in terms of the equipment we were given and trying to understand that. And, you know, my ethos for, the, for this was actually if we had face shields, yes, I know some people in infection control will say they're no better than other kind of things. Well, the guidance changed on that, but it's the, it's the understand. It's just reducing that level of anxiety and making people feel a little bit more protected and a little bit more engaged with the situation. And, and therefore it means that things hopefully work better until you do that. It doesn't change. Uh, would you agree with some of that? Yeah, I absolutely would. And there's, there's logic and science and there's belief. So, the problem is if people don't believe in what you're telling them or giving them to use, it almost doesn't matter because you've lost the moral battle and you can't actually get them to do their jobs feeling safe. So for me to, at that moment, um, it, it, it almost didn't matter what PhD was saying about equipment because if people weren't happy with it and they didn't feel safe, it was worthless. Mm -hmm. And I guess you mentioned using Facebook. I mean, it, how have you found using social media throughout this kind of episode? I mean, both health crisis and I guess prior to that. So there was a, there was a really interesting post a few weeks ago where um, I think a, a series of, I think, I think you, you as well, actually, um, quoted Twitter as being one of the most useful medical resources throughout COVID, which is yep. just absolutely stunning that, um, you know, a social media platform for, for medics has been the best method of communication about um, new evidence, new ways of practice, I mean, that's just crazy. It's brilliant. It's, mm -hmm. it's absolute genius, but also crazy to think of it like that. So for me, it's just, it's been an absolute godsend and, and so positive. Definitely. I mean, I've seen many people just simply say that when it comes to their appraisal and revalidation cycle for this year, they're just going to give people their Twitter account, you know, just, here, here you go everything's on there. here's the evidence for every single piece of information i've learned over the past few weeks because there's just been so much information out there but also understanding and filtering it is just it's so much easier when you've got mechanisms to support you i guess we've seen significant change happen over the past few weeks how, how do you feel you're going to take that moving forward because obviously we still have moving back to whatever normal life will be like after you know the health crisis and everything else but how are you going to take that forward with you know network work but also in terms of you know practice and that kind of stuff it's, it's a moment we mustn't lose because this is a moment where everyone's got the same mission so we're all on the same path and people feel united and networks feel united we've worked together on projects throughout this we've worked with our secondary care partnerships so if we pass that up it may not come around again for a generation so if we revert back into our little hidey holes and our individual practices and not talking to each other and not sharing um, we're going to lose a lot because i mean if, if nothing else i've just learned that um the achievements you can have working in ways that this is what we thought pcns was going to be wasn't it right so this mm -hmm. is what we thought pcns was going to be like um, where you could have a bunch of people who know their locality who know what their needs are and they could just bloody well get on and design it um, and that's what we've got now so yeah. I, I just don't want to lose that and i think i think gps are ready to, to, to do that now i think we're in a position where um because of the way the changes we've made the headspace is there so no no one feel well not no one but most people feel like there's a little bit of breathing room now um mm. i don't feel like i'm just surviving the day i feel like i'm actually living yeah i think one of the many comments that many people have made is that you know give us the trust and we'll show you we can do it well i think primary care and general practice has met a lot of that trust element in terms of you give us a challenge and we could probably deal with it and i think we have with you know the health crisis and stuff give us a bit of headspace and you're right i think potentially now practices have some headspace they may not have as much as they want but that doesn't mean you can't achieve more and actually with those two things we can probably give you the outcomes that are needed to help move our healthcare of our populations forward for the next 10 20 years easily if we're just given that opportunity I mean, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, this is this is this is a difference between micromanagement and macro management you know mm -hmm. macro management you 
people people give you what their intent is so for example hi i'd like you to fix up care homes so they're all working macro management we go away and do what we need to do micro management is we want you to do this many things we're going to measure this many things we're going to check that you've done this thing and do you know what all of a sudden no one's engaged um it's probably not right for a lot of communities and uh, and and the people at the bottom who are the experts that you know us uh, feel like we've just had all of our autonomy and sense stripped away from us and then we get back to what things like quaff did to us and turned us into a you know yeah. a whole generation of people who were just aiming for targets uh, and you know people are not targets they're not and, and we need to get that back so I, I guess with that in mind, move, looking towards the future, um, a couple of questions I like to ask people whenever I get the opportunity to get some time with them. Um, so imagine Matt Hancock comes up to you tomorrow and says, Dave, right, I, I need you to fix the health system for me. Yep, I'm going to clear all the red tape. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to give you a hundred million pounds. The only caveat you do have with that is that you have to spend it on health technology. How would you use those funds? This is where we cement what we've done with primary care and we start to enable those self-care mechanisms for patients but with clinician support. So a lot of the problems that have faced the, the country in terms of healthcare provision have been that the only route through to a successful completion of a patient journey has been referrals and secondary care. Um, so I would say what we need to do is move out the powers of diagnostics to both patients and uh, primary care clinicians um, invest in the most efficient bit of the healthcare system which is us um, you know what that investment is peanuts it's nothing mm-hmm. um, you know we, we, compared to what's spent on a, a new hospital for example the things that you could do with that imagine if we could give everyone access to home monitoring systems which exist it's not even sci-fi tech they, they exist now mm-hmm. um, and what you could achieve with that the bits that that unlocks so you know people get focused on the tech is what that unlocks is time with people who need us so we can then spend our expertise on people who've got complex multi-morbidity and problems which snarl up the rest of the healthcare system and just do it efficiently and with compassion as well Um, and that's what time would give us awesome i I love that answer i don't think i've had that one either before so yeah like it even more and i guess the other question i like to ask is um what's your favorite app that you have Oh, uh, health app or just in general? I'm, uh, um, so it tends to be a two-parter, your favorite kind of recreational, um, you know, you app, and then also your favorite work-based app. I think I might know what the work-based one is, but let's see if I get it right. Yeah, okay. Um, so recreational one, I, I'm a Whoop Band user. So I love my Whoop Band. This is the the health, health tracker. So it's enabled me to be a much better person by going to bed on time and behaving myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually feel a lot better for using it. It's this little thing that you wear on your wrist and it has a, um, a little heart rate sensor on it. So uh, it's like having Big Brother watching you all the time. <laughs> so as, as an anarchist, that's probably good for me. Um, work-based app, I mean, I've got to say Accurex has just been phenomenal. Okay. I really do. Um, I love Asthma GP, which is the system we use, but um, you know, we've used that for a little while. What, what, I, what I would say is Accurix as a, as, a, as a national healthcare implementation app has just been amazing. What a team that have been behind that, just turned on a sixpence and, and done the business for primary care. Definitely agree with you on the latter one in terms of the impact Accurix has had. Um, interesting, I thought you were going to say Slack, to be honest, because I know we, we've had a lot of discussions about Slack yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, but if people did want to check out more information about Accurix and stuff, again, here's our playlist that's coming up right now that you can have a look at that's got details on how you can kind of use Accurix if you don't already use it, but more importantly, how to use it better as well. So thank you for your time, Dave. I really appreciate it. I know I've learned so much from you as a clinical director. And I think for many people out there, definitely they need to be following you because I'm sure you're going to come up with numerous other things in in the coming months and years to show us how to do things more effectively, particularly from a digital perspective as well. Again, if people did want to contact you, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, just grab me on Twitter, please. So at Dave underscore DLT. Awesome. And EGP learners, if you have enjoyed this, definitely let us know what you think about it on Twitter. Both myself and Dave are on there. So I'm at DrGana52. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love it if you could do that. Or if you're watching on YouTube, definitely subscribe, ring the bell, and make sure you get notified of all of our content first and foremost. And as always, EGP learners here to help save you and your patients' time by taking out some your primary care and learning. We'll catch you next episode.